the picnic last week uh, was the best picnic ever. <laughs> yeah, and it's not because of the food. And it's because of the way people were um, that really blessed me. Food was amazing. I mean, there was a, I didn't really think we we're going to get heavy, but we did. So that was, that was really good. But it just the way that I felt the Holy Spirit was working in our church. And that just like in the book of Acts, people were interested in the others. And, and they didn't just let people be, but they were deliberately reaching out and having fellowship, being interested in the other person. I was so moved by that, that I told my mom. I called her and I said, mom, we have the best picnic. And it's not because of the karbi, it's because the way the Holy Spirit is working in our church. And my mom said, pray. <laughs> like what? Like, this is where you really need to pray because this is where you get, become proud or you just fizz out. You just enjoy being together so much that you miss the big picture. And um, which I, I think, I, yeah, we will talk about a little bit later. But before we get to that, um, my real introduction for today's sermon is um, the experience of me lending out a large sum of cash to a, a good friend of mine. And I told you little snippets of this story here and there, but this is a different version or different part of the story. Um, so when I was in university, a friend of mine wanted, needed a large sum of cash, and I just happened to have money that I was saving up for tuition, and foolishly, I lent it out to him. But before I did that, uh, I, I knew him for some time, a year or so, and, and he was telling me that his uncle is a pastor, and that one of his church members was in a tight spot financially. And he was wondering if the pastor can lend him money. So being a good pastor, quote unquote, good pastor that he is, loving pastor at least, right, that he gave him his money, a large sum of his money, a significant amount. And once he received that money, he ran away. And he was never to be found again. And he recalls that event, and he was like a high school kid, and he, he was, he's still bitter about it. He's, he's in his 20s, and he's like still bitter, and he's talking about that. And, you know, how could you take money from a pastor? I mean, frauding someone is bad enough, but how could you take money from a pastor and run away? And the interesting thing is, that is exactly what he did to me. Yeah, I was struggling pastor trying to get my undergrad and pay for my tuition and working three jobs and he took my money gambled it away and he paid back part of it and then he ran away he flew back to Korea that just story reminds me you know I before I skip bitter about that but now this story reminds me of the fact that we're walking contradiction that we believe in one thing, and we truly do. I mean, when he told me that story of his uncle's church member that he taught and preached and prayed for and nurtured, he took his money and ran away. He really felt that was injustice and that was wrong. He wasn't putting up like, you know, moral front. It wasn't hypocritical. He really meant every word that that was wrong. And how could he do that? But then he turned around and did the same thing himself. This shows me that no matter how much we believe in something, no matter how strongly we feel about certain things, that in the end, we may not live the way that we believe. And that's just the fact. That's just the life. And today in this text, we have a group of Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit. But on the day of Pentecost, they, the Spirit came down like fire on them, and they started speaking in different languages, and they experienced many miracles. And, 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 and the words of Jesus, preach the gospel in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and to the world. It's a geographical, if you will, what I share with you, this isn't just geographical transition, but on a surface level, it's a geographical um, distance, transmission of the gospel. 
And they believed in that. They experienced the Holy Spirit. And the church was growing by the thousands. Yet, they stayed in Jerusalem. It was comfortable to be a Jerusalem Christian, to be with people that they know, to be with people, to, to, to uh, worship with Jewish people, if you will. They believed in the word of Jesus. They believed in the gospel. They believed in the power of the Holy Spirit, not only because intellectually, but they experienced it. But they couldn't take the gospel just a few miles away into Samaria. Because Samaritans were half Jewish. And Jewish people call them dogs. And they have a, a nasty history between the two. When Assyrians came a long time ago, and, and they came to conquer uh, Jerusalem, Judah, Samaritans came with them to kill them. To, and, and then when Assyrians backed away, they decided to capture their half-brother, if you will, and they sold them into slavery. So they remember that. And they remember how they corrupted them and how they persecuted them when they came back from their exile from Babylon. A lot of bad blood between this genetically, ethnically very close people. To preach the gospel to them would take a lot. They believe that they should. They know that they want to. But the way they lived was contradictory to what they had in their heart. And today we see that after the death of uh, Stephen, at the hands of Paul and his orchestrating party, the church scatters. And they scatter to Samaria, Judea, and, and to the rest of the world. And from there, we, the story of Philip gets highlighted. Christians didn't become missionaries. They didn't share the gospel because they really believed in God and they really believed in this commission of Christ, but because they were driven out. And God used that. Before I go any further in my sermon, I just want to give you a heads up that today's sermon will not um, help you maybe with your loneliness or your sins or maybe, I don't know, to mature right now in, in faith. The sermon will be applicable to you many years from now on, and including myself. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm shy about sharing the gospel. I pray for my neighbors, and I make contact with them, and I pray for opportunities. I, I, one of the person that I've been praying for is Igor. He's my Slovakian neighbor found in the neighborhood, and I, I run into him, and we talk. And, I, I, and um, I'm just praying that God will open opportunities so that I can share the gospel with him. I, I really like Igor. I, I love his stories. Uh, he's a Yugoslavian, and, and he, he tells me many, many good stories from when he was young. Anyway. But we can't forget the commission of Christ to share and make disciples. And when you hear that, you feel, that's not for me. I'm not ready, and I don't want to get ready, and I don't want to think about sharing the gospel, let alone going out of my comfort zone to share the gospel and make disciples. You would have to inconvenience yourself greatly to journey with someone at a prolonged period in close proximity, risking your reputation, risking being backstabbed, and risking all of your effort coming to nothing. Sharing the gospel, making disciple, is not a priority for us, for many of us. But knowing God, experiencing God is, but transferring that experience and knowledge of God to somebody else for some reason is not. But what I'm saying to you is that one day it will be. It will be. I, not a prophet, but I predict if we're going to be Christian and if we're going to be church, 
there will come a day where you and I will want to share the gospel. You and I will want to make disciples because we have been made disciples through Christ. And you can't help but to share him. I know you don't believe me. And if I were in your shoes and somebody said that to me when I was a young, young man, I, I probably wouldn't have believed them either. I would have agreed with them. I would have maybe anticipated, but you know, it's, there's a gap. So it's hard to see. It, it, it's like trying to buy Tesla before Elon joined Tesla, right? There, there's a big gap of where we are and, and where we will be in the future. But I'm telling you that this is where Holy Spirit will lead us. I'm certain of it. And if he doesn't, we're in big trouble. But I know he will. Here, Philip is led by the Holy Spirit. And he is in Samaria. Even in Jesus' ministry, Jesus only visited Samaria once. Never again after that. He met the woman at the well, and never after that, Jesus focused his ministry in Jerusalem, or, or, or south of Samaria. And here, we need to take notice of three things. And I'm giving you a tip on how to read a Bible, too, but three things. One, you need to look at where he is. And I explained to you in somewhat of detail that Samaria is significant, that this is one place where people, Jewish people, do not want to go. And secondly, I want you to notice who, not only where, but who Philip encounters. So putting aside Samaria, that this is a place that Jewish people would not venture into, that Jewish people at the time, disciples were very content to do God's stuff in Jerusalem, but not in Samaria. But we see that when Philip is led by the Holy Spirit, he encounters an Ethiopian eunuch. And that is so significant. That in Samaria, the land that no Jewish person would go, no reputable Jewish person would go, he encounters, the Holy Spirit leads him to find an Ethiopian eunuch. I know a lot of you are named Daniel. So there's a little bit of a competition going on in our church. How many Daniels will we have before, you know, John Kim's grow in numbers, right? And I encourage all the John Kim's to grab more John Kim's to this church. But um, in Jewish custom, Daniel is not so favored. Did you know that? Uh, when I found that out, I was kind of surprised. And I, if you're, if you're Daniel, God bless you. There's nothing wrong with your name and you're okay, all right? Don't go out changing your name, Daniels. But Daniel, according to, not in the Bible, but in history and, and logic and culture, he probably was a eunuch. Uh, he never married, that's certain in the Bible. And when people came back to Jerusalem, Daniel was alive, but he never came back himself, he stayed. And that's one of the question marks. Why didn't he come back? And Daniel, as you know, wonderful stories of Daniel in the Bible, right? The prophecies, his courage, standing up to the courts and, and risking his life, prayers that he offered to the Lord, knowing that that would get him in trouble and that, that would get him executed. He never abandoned his faith. Yet, in Jewish people's mind, Daniel is not favored because he cannot reproduce. In reproduction, Jewish people believe, will come the Messiah. If you cannot reproduce, and you see in the book of Genesis, the fight and, 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 and jealousy that goes on when, when they're, you know, who's sleeping with who? And who's getting babies? And who's bearing a, a child and a son? And in the same way, Daniel couldn't reproduce, and he was not favored. Why does God move Philip into Samaria only to run into a eunuch who's not even a Jew, who's not even a Jewish person, who cannot reproduce. His line ends right there. A 
up until now, your religion grew if your family grew. Your religion grew if your nation grew. It all meant the power of the virility of human being. How many kids can you have? How many wives can you have? How many sons will you have? And how much money will you have to support all this so that your tent may be enlarged? But the Holy Spirit had a different idea. It's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. That new Jerusalem, the new church, the new kingdom of God is not ethically, ethnically oriented but it is passed on by the Spirit, by faith. No longer your ethnicity, no longer your virility, but God takes Philip to meet a eunuch who cannot reproduce, who will not be good used to him in Samaria. Wouldn't you want strategically a high-ranking Samarian, Samaritan a, a male who has his deep roots in that region, who has influence and can rally people. But no, he's a traveler. He's from Ethiopia. He's a eunuch. And God says, go preach the gospel to him. God gives dignity to eunuch. God gives dignity to a traveler and a stranger. That the gospel is not for people that we're close to. Gospel Christians cannot mingle within the boundaries of their comfort zone. That we must welcome, encounter, and be with those that we inherently consider less. Not to say that there's a group of people that are less than us here. But what gospel is saying, the salvation that you have received through faith through grace, through faith, must be transmitted to those who you think is less. For Christ came down, made himself nothing, and he was with you. Live like him. That's the message. Still, this message, I'm sure, is daunting and is heavy on our heart, and, and we don't want to kind of live like this. I understand. But the Holy Spirit will lead us there. And the hope that I see in this text is this. When the Holy Spirit told Philip to go talk to eunuch, uh, if you can have that verse up, that'd be great. Go over and join this chariot. And next verse. So Philip ran to him. Holy Spirit didn't command him to run. It was Philip's choice. He ran to him. He didn't call out and say, you eunuch, inferior man you, let me tell you about Jesus. But he ran. Why did he run? Because he wanted to share the gospel. He wanted to give him what he has. And he felt that he was equal in every way as himself. There will come a day for us where we too will feel that his burden is light and his yoke is easy. What we think today is difficult and challenging and daunting for us, he will get us running. He will fill us. He will teach us. The Holy Spirit will, will, like, it will bubble and fizz in us that we will run and sharing the gospel will be a burden and yoke that is easy and light. I promise you. As you become a disciple, the day will come where sharing Jesus is easy. I used to have a great trouble sharing the Lord. But if you give me time of the day, I can tell you how Jesus was my light. And I can talk to you about that for at least 10 minutes. Okay, a little bit more maybe. But I can tell you from my own life why Jesus is the light. Not abstract, like Jesus is bright and he shines. 
I can tell you, I can tell anyone about the time when he shed the light on me and said, John, life is not about you. It's not about you making, uh, being an effective person and, and getting approval from people. Deep inside, you're working and you're preaching and you're doing all these things, but you're dying inside because in you, you want approval from people. The day that the Lord shed light on me to say, you are a servant. You must be less and I must be more. That day, Jesus became light. And the freedom and the burdens and yoke that I shed that day, I can tell people about that. I have experience. I have testimony. I can tell people how Jesus is truly the good news. They will come a day as you learn to be a disciple and obey his word, that you too will have testimony. And just like Philip explained the passage from Isaiah to this eunuch, that you will be able to explain Jesus that you know and that you encountered by the whole power of the Holy Spirit. It will not be how may Jesus made you rich. It won't be about how Jesus made you healthy and wealthy, but it will be about how Jesus freed you from yourself. You will able to share. At last week picnic, um, I think it was Didi, he pointed out, can you move that? And she was pointing at the picnic uh, blanket. And I saw a cicada, what's the word? When It's a bug that before it becomes a cicada. Have you seen that? It, it looks monstrous, it, it looks hideous, but it, it, it's, it, it's a thing that lives underground. And when it's ready around mid-August, it will come out and it'll climb a tree. And about, it, 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 like six in the morning, seven in the morning, whatever, uh, it, it will, molt and you'll see this even more hideous cicada come out of that right just bigger version with wings and this makes loud noise so when i take my dog out for a walk in the woods i, I see those things uh, empty shell molted and hanging on a tree bark on the bottom and i see quite a lot of them because i have them in my neighborhood and then, and and one day we will be like that you know, if you take a cicada bug and you take a scalpel or knife and you cut its back, it will die, right? It's his skin, <laughs> it's his skin. If you cut it, he'll die, right? We all know this, right? But one day, it will break its shell and come out. And instead of dying, it will live the next phase of its life flying in the air, making a lot of noise. That will be for us one day. Right now, we feel like sharing the gospel. It's like somebody, God taking a scalpel and go, share the gospel. You're like, no, that's a terrible idea. But there will, be, there will be a day when you're like, I don't need this anymore. This is not me anymore. I'm a disciple that makes disciples. I can't help but to share the gospel. I will leave behind the thing that I felt was my life. I will leave it on a tree bark and I will fly away and I will never return to it again. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's new life. And the church is at that point. It's shedding its Jerusalem, entering into Samaria. And you will once again shed that skin and leave behind that form and go to Judea and, and, and to the world. Brothers and sisters, we must wait for this. We must diligently wait for the Holy Spirit and pray for this. Even though we may feel like this is not for me, this is not happening for me, but the Holy Spirit is leading us to Samaria. He will take us there. We must be ready to share the gospel by becoming a disciple ourselves. And, and surprisingly, the answer is so elemental that we 
in order for us to encounter our own Ethiopian eunuch, we must encounter Christ who met us when we were sinners and we held no value. Collect testimonies. Let God transform you, slay your sins, bring your sins and your weaknesses and brokenness to Christ, let him work on it. Whatever idols you have, whatever identity that you're holding on today that I want to be this person, that's killing you by the way, bring that to Christ and see what he says. See what he says and see how he transforms you so that you can molt out of your skin. Let us pray together. Father, you have come, sent Philip to Samaria, an unlikely place, unwanted place, and you had him preach to a eunuch. God, I pray that we will not calculate our encounter with our brothers and sisters, or we want to calculate the worth of others that we will be open to and meeting strangers in our midst. That we pray that we will be welcoming the strangers in our midst. That that's, this is part of our discipleship making or becoming a disciple. That we will love, we will be hospitable to strangers among us. That we will open our hearts to those who we consider less and repent that this is, this is how we feel. God, we pray that we will approach those who are different from us. But before that, let us experience Christ who loved us as we are. Help us to become a disciple. Let us collect testimonies through slaying our sins, cutting down our idols, and surrendering the lovable and wonderful identities that we're seeking and building. Help us to be a servant. Humble us, God, that we may truly, truly um, know the love of the Father that he has for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.